So last lesson for today is it's it. It's the power. It is going to take you over that next level for ASM and have you leave today feeling a, quite a bit more confident in how you can explain ASM and just for your own peace of mind, first off, that last exercise, that's pretty easy to do, right? Get those file types and you see that just within a matter of 15, 20, 30 minutes, you now are protected against a variety of attack types. And this is real world stuff. Creating the policy with rapid deployment, adding the file type enforcement, that's not gonna be much more challenging for any website you're protecting. You're good to go. So we're gonna cover three main topics in this lesson, three topics. And I'll make sure to emphasize each one as we move through it. And if you can leave this lesson and you think you really understand these three topics, you got it, then you're good to go. You'll be very, very good to go. So the first thing we're gonna talk about, we're gonna do a little review from before lunch. So I wanna make sure everybody feels comfortable with what we've covered so far about ASM. So as a reminder, if we have multiple apps, each with its own VIP, I've got my online banking, I've got my intranet or intranet, each one of these can have its own security policy. And each security policy can have a variety of different security measures in place. So over there, it's a yellow policy because it's not very secure. It's secure, but it's not very secure. In fact, maybe I'm only using attack signatures here. Totally valid. This one, of course, is much more secure. We've got a lot more things turned on. And as the request comes in, that policy checks it to see if it's in any way malicious. And if it's not, then it sends it down. And of course, we can do the response checking as well. Another feature that we have, took it out of boot camp, but I got two demos on it, is our data guard feature. The data guard feature is what protects against uh, leakage, information leakage, like credit card numbers. So we could check that on the way out. So each policy can have any number of security features configured. Some of the basics, the compliance like a valid method, valid HTTP version, and then are they valid methods and from a list, the git post, and then attack signatures, the basic stuff. That's what you got with your rapid deployment, all of that. But then we can start adding more as we want to. So I've added file type enforcement for this policy, but not for that one over there. This is what you did before lunch. We can also add parameter enforcement. We can add some length enforcements, which we'll talk about. We can have a URL list. So this is my URL whitelist, my parameter whitelist. We can add things like brute force protection, web scraping protection, CSRF protection, geolocation enforcement, all these other things that we can apply to any of these policies as we see fit. We created the policy, very simple, name, policy, template type, and the virtual server in question. We used the rapid deployment template because again, it offered us some nice features. I guess I didn't have those features called out. That's okay, you guys remember. And then we also had a bunch of other templates as well. But we use rapid deployment, ah, here we are, there's my call outs. We use rapid deployment because it's very quick, very fast, enables a lot of security features, but not too many, so it uh, 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 lowers the false positives. And then we can add to it. We can get to blocking mode a little bit faster. Has all those attack signatures in place. Then we had our file type enforcement that you did. So by the end of your exercise, you had a nice defined list of file types. Again, I like this for a couple of reasons. One, because it's very easy to set this up and it rarely changes much for an application. They don't usually add a lot of new file types and it adds a good level of security. It's a good bang for the buck. And not a lot of overhead on the, big I, on the ASM because really we're just looking at a file type, that's it. We're not having to examine the entire HTTP request. Then we spent some time on the learning and blocking settings page. And I had you do one specific thing that we didn't talk about, but we will talk about a little bit later on, which was I had you adjust 
the learning score speed, which we do for the lab environment. Wouldn't necessarily always recommend that out in the real world environment. So we're basically trying to, we're, we're fooling these numbers so that we could simulate m more requests over time. But the, the normal time, that value that you changed, what that means is that's what prevents this user from just refreshing an invalid request and having it increase the learning score. Now, of course, if I were to lower those values, as we did, now maybe his bad request would have more impact. But we did a lot of things on this page, and you're going to do a lot of things on this page as you play with ASM throughout all of your time with, a, with, uh, with the product. So we are playing with this down here. This is something we're going to talk about in just a moment, trusted IP addresses. So you guys went in and you configured the file type learning. A couple of you saw what happened if we forgot that first drop-down list. We didn't get any learning. <laughs> Did not happen. And I told you we we're going to talk about these last four rows now after lunch, what those mean. Um, and why I would include those along with illegal file type. So we'll cover that. But that's what you did before lunch. Then you went in and you did some work in the traffic learning page. You looked at all the entries. Now I've got a lot more in here. I've got illegal URLs. I've got parameters, illegal parameters, and so forth. Sorry, too far. So you went in, you looked at the learning score, this is a really cool page. A really t where you guys aren't going to play with this a whole lot. But uh, remember, I was talking to you a couple days ago about when you get signature triggers and you really want to see what's been triggered. That's where you're going to come over here and look if this has a number. That means we have signatures that have been triggered, but they're not in enforcement yet. And you click on that, and it takes you to a page. And that you would do that in that little demo that I sent to you. Then we have the signatures. We talked about that. Every six weeks, we get new signatures. Every policy has its own list of signatures. And um, we can add more on the learning and blocking settings page. As many as you want. We just don't want to have too many more than we need for performance. So that's our review. And I think we can move on. No questions there. Doesn't sound like. All right, so let's re review a little bit about what is a parameter. The parameters are input fields, user input fields that we have on forms on websites. They might just be open fields, they might be drop down lists, they might be check boxes, and all of those are parameters. And this is a parameter as well. Anything we do, anything users do to interact with the website. So when I click on register, this is going to be a post request to send that data to the web server. You also might see parameters listed in the URI. To, to examine the parameters, what you want to look for first is the question mark right after the full URL. At the end of the URL, if there's a question mark, it's now being followed by parameter names and the values submitted by the user. So this example on the screen is me doing a search request in Amazon, I believe. Yes. And so the first parameter is called search alias. And then there's an ampersand. The ampersand will always identify a new parameter. So my, uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, no, the first parameter is called URL. And then there's the equal sign. And then it's whatever the value of that parameter. The second parameter is field keywords and then an equal sign. And then you can see exactly what I typed in to that field, which was iPhone 7 accessories. And there's another ampersand. So there's another parameter called prefix. Anyway, that's how you can tell. Now this parameter, uh, these parameters are being submitted in a Git request because they're not being clicked on. So anyway, those are some ways that you see parameters. And uh, so we're going to talk about adding the parameter whitelist, the allowed parameters page. So I told you we're going to cover three categories of different bits of information. So the first category is trusted, I'm sorry, manual, 
versus automatic learning. Told you earlier we were going to cover this. Manual versus automatic learning. So let's talk about manual learning first. This should sound familiar because it's what you just did in your last exercise. So we had these requests coming in by the users. In this case, we're doing URLs. And each one of those URLs is being added to the suggestion list on the traffic learning page. Then they submit uh, something invalid. It gets added to the suggestion list. Then they submit a post. They put in their username and password and click on the sign in button. So it's going to send us a post request with the parameter names and parameter values. These can be a little bit trickier because when you see these lists of parameter names, they don't always make a lot of sense. I'll give you an example. If you look at the parameter name of the Google search field, the parameter name is Q. So if I saw there was a parameter called Q, am I going to know that that's something I want to add to my policy? Hmm, maybe not. Does anybody know if how I could actually find out the names of those parameters up in that form? I can go in and view the source code, or I can use the inspect is even easier, because if you inspect, it'll take you right to the field in question. So now I'm looking at the source code of this form, and I can see that, ah, one parameter is called user or online ID, one is called passcode. So those are obviously correct, good suggestions. And then this continues over the course of a week or over how long, and the learning scores slowly go up. Some might hit 100. This one here is real low because it hasn't been requested a whole lot. So in manual learning, as you guys did in your last exercise, the administrator has to go in and accept those suggestions. And they can, they can accept a suggestion before it hits 100%. That's fine. If they know for a fact that URL is valid, they can accept it whenever they want. They also might want to ignore or delete these bad entries. I recommend ignoring them so they just get out of the list and you don't see them anymore. So this is what you did in your last exercise, and this is manual learning. That's the manual learning mode. Then we have automatic learning. Automatic learning is a little bit different, but it's very similar. So again, I have all these suggestions for URLs, for parameters, for invalid requests. Same thing. Requests are coming in. Learning scores are going up. Based on all these requests from lots of users over, you know, lots of IP addresses, sessions, over a grand period of time that it takes to increase that learning score. And then eventually items are going to hit 100%. So in automatic learning, those items that hit 100% are automatically added as an acceptable part of the positive security for the security policy. So now that's going to be a valid URL. As the learning scores continue to increase, as long as they hit 100%, they automatically get added to the policy. So what happens if this hits 100%? What does happen if it hits 100%? It gets added to the policy, exactly. So a question a lot of people have is, well, how do I prevent that? What do I do? And so forth. So there's two things about that. And, and, and earlier I said, you know, these, these bad file types, we could leave them in the list. You know, we could we'd leave them there if we want, as long as we're in manual learning. That's what I said. Because in automatic learning, I don't want to leave them in the list forever, because even though the learning score may go up very slowly, it may someday hit 100%. So, it, so, uh, so a couple of things here. First, even in automatic learning mode, an administrator can come in and automatic, or manually still add items before they hit 100%. But the important thing is they're going to want to monitor this, and they want to take items out preferably ignoring them so they don't reappear in the list because once they're ignored and they're not in the list, no more learning score increase, 
no worry about those ever being added to the security policy. So the benefit of automatic learning should be obvious. It takes all that work you just had to do in your last exercise and it does it for you. Builds the policy for you. Can you automatically ignore? No. How would it know? Like after a period of time, you know, like after a week, let's say, whatever is under 20%, just ignore. Whatever is under 20%? You mean if something stays under 20%? Well, first off, the answer is no. <laughs> so instead of trying to figure out, I know that the answer is no. Did you write an iRule to do it? No, because iRule only affects the application, um, not the engine of ASM. So good, good, good try. So that's automatic versus manual learning. That's the first category. That's the first thing. So anybody have questions about that specific? I have. Two demos, one called using manual learning. I have another one called using automatic learning. They're pr both pretty short, and they just show the difference on, on how to do both of these things. Then we have another second, the second topic. The second topic is the concept of trusted requests versus untrusted requests. So let's discuss this. A trusted request is one that's coming from an IP address that I have defined as a trusted IP address. You may remember seeing that in the traffic learning page. I'm sorry, the learning and blocking settings page. So these are two of my developers, and I know they're using the application, and they're testing the application. They're using all the pages of the application. So I've defined their IP addresses. You can either define IP addresses or an IP address range. Not a range, but a, a network address. And then we have untrusted requests. Untrusted requests are those from anybody with an IP address that I haven't defined as trusted. So this could be all the people out on the internet. It could be other people inside my organization that aren't on my trusted address list. So why is this important? It's important because whether requests are coming from a trusted versus an untrusted request, dramatically changes how fast the learning score goes up. So let's take a look at this. So I have all these untrusted users out there, and they're all requesting this customer.asp page. And so all these requests from all these untrusted users, even though there's a lot of them, it's just slowly increasing the learning score for that URL. And then I have some requests from these guys inside the organization, that are trusted to me, and they're accessing the employees page, and their requests will increase the learning score much faster. So here's the kind of the summary, the idea of this, and we can do both. We can be learning the policy from trusted and untrusted requests. Nothing wrong with that. I told you earlier that it, when you go through this building uh, learning process, you can put it in a dev environment, or you could have it out in production. But if it's in production, all the requests from all these untrusted sources, they'll build the policy, but very slowly. But if I simultaneously also have a group of users that I have trusted, and they're accessing the application, then we're going to build the policy much faster from them. And that's kind of the recommended method. So you can build a policy in manual or automatic mode, using trusted or untrusted requests, they're, they're intermixable. So I like building a policy in automatic mode with trusted requests because it builds it very fast. And it does it all for me. I don't have to go in and do all the work manually myself. Questions about that? Trusted versus untrusted requests. That's the second category. The first two categories are the easy ones. <laughs> so you guys adjusted the learning score speeds. You'll notice that there are two categories of learning score speeds, untrusted versus trusted. Now you understand what that is, what the difference is. You'll also notice that these numbers are a lot higher for, trust, uh, for untrusted requests. 
So for example, in order to make any movement in the learning score for something, it takes 50 different requests from different people in different sessions within an hour time frame to make any adjustment. Whereas from a trusted source, all it takes is one request from a unique user to make an adjustment. So the rule of thumb is the higher those numbers, the more requests are going to be needed to make learning score adjustments, to make it go up. There's actually three different default speeds. Learning speed, we've got uh, the fast, we've got the medium, we've got the slow. And the main thing that changes is the number of sources and the time frame over what period of time. But we actually have a fourth category. And the fourth category is custom because I can put whatever values in here I want. So this is now going to be a very slow to build policy. It's going to take a lot of requests to build it. And the more requests I get, yeah, again, something I said earlier is, in my opinion, probably 90% of the access to a website is valid. So we're going to get a really good picture of what this website really is supposed to be just from what people are doing in most cases. So one last thing to notice is that regardless of whether you're in fast or slow, the trusted traffic numbers don't change because I can't build it any faster than one source, one request over zero period of time. <laughs> so in your next exercise, I'm going to have you adjust your learning score drastically so that we can build a policy automatically very quickly, as quickly as we possibly can. I would never recommend to adjust these, these values in your customers' environments unless maybe they're doing all their building in a dev, in a dev trusted place. Maybe it's not a bad idea. Build it pretty quickly. So earlier, we did the building of a policy very quick. Three fields, name, template, virtual server. But I also mentioned we had advanced option. So when you choose the advanced option, we're going to see some more things. But the first thing we're going to talk about is comprehensive. Or did I miss one? Let me see. Go back. Hmm. Well, in case I do miss it, comprehensive and fundamental are two other policy templates that you can use and they can they increase the number of enabled features so rapid deployment has a bunch of features that are enabled by default fundamental has even more features that are enabled by default and comprehensive has the most features that are enabled by default i believe our documentation has a pretty good uh, description of the things that are enabled in these I wouldn't necessarily worry about knowing all of them, but that's the idea there. So now I'm choosing advanced. Now we've got some additional things that we can enable if we want. I think I'm going to scroll down here. Oh, first, learning mode. So what's interesting, first off, when you guys used your, when you guys created your policy earlier, you still could have chose advanced. So what I uh, am getting at here is when you choose rapid deployment as your template type, it defaults this to manual learning. When you choose comprehensive, it defaults it to automatic learning. You can change that in either case if you want to. Then you've got the enforcement mode. When you choose comprehensive, it goes right to blocking mode. You can change that if you want. The way that automatic learning works with blocking mode, it's kind of fascinating is you would think, well, wait a minute, there's nothing configured yet. So how come it's not blocking everything? Well, it's because of all the nothing's been actually uh, configured, like no file types yet, no parameters. We still have the wildcards in there and so forth. So what happens is you could be in automatic learning in blocking mode, and the policy will begin building over time from all these requests. Nothing will be blocked. But eventually, at some point in time, ASM is going to think the file type list is complete. It's going to think it's complete. And then somebody might request something 
that's not on the list. And they'll get blocked. But it'll continue to add the suggestion. And continue to add the suggestion. And if that suggestion hits up to 100%, it will then add that to the list. It'll continue to learn. It'll continue to build the policy as long as we stay in automatic mode. So it's very interesting the way that the blocking works while I'm still learning. And I won't go into that a lot more. It's just part of the, the intelligence of how ASM makes decisions. It says, I've got enough requests to feel comfortable about this. Oh, there's a different request. I'm not going to allow it but I'm going to think about it. I'm going to learn from it. Maybe I'll add it later if I get a bunch more of those. But there's a point that you should disable the, the auto-learning. Absolutely. A good example of one of the demos I have. So when I told you earlier that I created a couple of demos because I get a question a lot. What happens later if the policy gets updated? I'm not the policy. The website gets updated. So the process that you would go through is you would start, you got the new web application, you'd start this whole automatic learning process, have people accessing it, monitor what you're learning, okay, tuning this, getting that, three weeks, four weeks have gone by, I think we are good to go, we've tested everything, looked good, I will then disable learning altogether, no, no manual, no automatic, the third option is disabled, and then blocking will, will fully taken effect, all the blocking of anything that's, that's invalid. But now, two months later, the development team has added a bunch of new URLs and a bunch of new fields and so forth. All we have to do is go back to automatic learning and they start accessing those pages. In fact, the best people to access those pages, the development team, who are my trusted IP addresses, and they'll add that stuff to the policy just like that so within a few hours, we could have all of the updates to the policy, and then we go back to disabled mode. All right, so uh, the next thing we have down a little lower is notice we have the server technologies. So we added this later. We, sh we showed you, uh, I showed you the, um, there's another UI page, but you could actually add that right from the get-go. Application language is something that you want to enable for your demos. The idea here is ASM can figure out a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, you'll notice, I, I don't remember if I have you guys do this in this exercise, but I have a, uh, at least a couple of the demos that show this. When you build a policy in automatic mode using trusted IP addresses and you don't select the server technologies, after just a few requests, ASM will tell you what your server technologies actually are it will learn the server technologies for you. Similar to the application language, it'll learn it for you. The problem is, when you're doing a demo, is all the other things I want you to be doing in your policy, they don't actually start until the application language is figured out. So I just have you change it right from the get-go to Unicode. Just talked about that a couple moments ago. Here's where I place in my trusted IP addresses, if I have any, don't have to, but if you have any, I'm using a network address. Learning speed, got that. Signature staging, we'll talk about a little bit later on, but just remember, staging can be enabled or disabled, just remember that for now. And I also want you to remember this, this, this readiness enforcement period, just remember that for a little bit later. And here's one last thing I want to mention, this is something else that another thing that connected in my head in the last couple of months is I used to combine this, putting in a trusted IP address and then changing this to fast because I wanted to really make the learning as quickly as possible. And then I would go in and adjust my learning score speeds as well. But I realized recently that this learning score speed only applies to untrusted requests. So once I put this in here, this has nothing to do, this, this is irrelevant. Just something to keep in mind, something I learned. Yes? Uh, I know that we didn't go through that one, but I was wondering uh, if your, the guys that are doing maintenance on the, the, the applications, they could be using a different model of the, 
the big IP like the APM and connecting to it through APM to get access to that, right? I don't know why not. Okay. As long as the requests are hitting the virtual server, doesn't matter where they come from. And, and, and then I could include a block of IPs that the APM would provide to the VPN tunnels in that. Sure. Yeah, as long as that's what's being seen as the incoming IP address. Yes, absolutely. Would you do me a favor and hand me my water bottle behind you? I'm getting dry throat. Yeah. I always get, this is the, I get, ex, I get truly exhausted on ASM day because it's a lot of talking and it's a lot of explanation and I love it, but I usually go home and collapse. <laughs> All right, so now we come to our third category of uh, subject, and that is learning versus staging. I think this is one of the most important things to understand when it comes to ASM and security policies. So we're going to start with learning. What is learning all about? So learning is the process of building some of our whitelists, like our file type whitelist. That's what you guys did in your last exercise, is you had to learn about file types. And the result of learning was a nice file type list. That's what it looked like in the config utility. We can also learn about parameters and get a nice parameter list, which look like, oh, I'm sorry, that's URLs. Everybody's looking at it like I'm, you can tell me if I make a mistake, it's okay. I don't get mad. So that's my URL list. Here's what the URL look, list looks like. Um, <laughs> fill out the cards. <laughs> so you'll notice the first four URLs that kind of have a weird, what is all that? What do those mean? Anybody know what those first four URLs are? Regular, Regular expressions. And what are they representing? The what? The uh, of what, though? GIF. So the first one is GIF. Any, so in other words, we don't list a f URL for every GIF. That just implies any GIF is valid. Any JPEG is valid. Any PDF and so forth. So that's another whitelist. Then we got the third whitelist, parameters. There's my list of parameters, my Q parameter I mentioned earlier. And that's what it looks like in the configuration utility. And then, of course, we can also learn about cookies. We can learn about a lot of things in the security policy. Remember all of those learn checkboxes in the traffic, uh, the learning and blocking settings page. But these are just the first, the three examples that I think are the easiest. So that's what learning is all about. And I mentioned this earlier, that these are all called entities. So we learn about entities. Then we have staging. What does staging apply to? So I'm going to focus just on one file type for this example. I'm going to focus on the ASP file type. So I've already got ASP as a valid file type in my list. Now I'm also going to define some attributes about the ASP file type, such as how long the URL can be. The default is 100 characters. That's not the URI. If I have, uh, so for example, there's the URL. And uh, if that URL was submitted by a user, then that's valid because that's only 31 bytes long. But if somebody submitted that URL, that's way too long, and that would not be, that would be considered an illegal request, possibly getting blocked. We also have the full HTTP request length, the request line, all the headers the body, any input fields, and the default there is 5,000 characters long. So that is a total of 719 bytes. That's a valid HTTP request. So then we have the query string. The query string is where I add all of the parameter names and values after it. And so we have a, re, uh, a limit of 1,000 bytes, 1,000 characters. Again, that's kind of a default length for that that attribute. And that would be a valid query string because that's only 71 bytes. That's fine. Um, but this 
has a lot of fake uh, parameters and values in there. And that would be considered illegal, possibly blocked. Then the last attribute is the post data link, so that's when you're submitting input fields. So we've got these four attributes, four different attributes about that one entity, that one file type. So those are all known as attributes. This is what they look like when you're looking at your configuration utility. You probably saw that. Those are all your link limits. But those can be customized. So, for example, I can either manually do this or ASM can do it for me, which I'll explain in a few more minutes, where we can have different attributes for every file type. In this case, different lengths for every file type. Totally possible. And that's what that would look like. Um, there we go. So those have some different length values, 5,000, 6,000, and so forth. Let's take a look at parameters because it's a little bit easier sometimes to understand how this applies to a parameter. Hold the thought. Is that okay? So I'm going to focus on two parameters here. First name. I'm only going to focus on one. Excuse me. First name. So some of the attributes about a parameter include the data type. What kind of data can go in there? And our top level data type is alphanumeric. Numbers and letters. So if somebody submitted that first name that would be considered illegal and possibly blocked. Another attribute about parameters is the maximum length that can be input by a user. So this particular first name would be illegal, possibly blocked. The other thing that's really cool about our uh, security policy capabilities is we can define literally every character on the keyboard that is acceptable to go into that input field. So for our first name field, we have said only letters A through Z and nothing else. And so that name input would be invalid, or excuse me, illegal, possibly blocked. Finally, there's a username that is legal. So again, every entity, in this case, every parameter can have its own unique attributes. So my comment has a much longer maximum length than my first name field. My comment also has a lot of additional characters that are allowed inside the field. I have a data type called phone. I have another data type called integer. And I can put in the range for the integer. This can be done manually, but the key here to staging is this can be done by ASM. And that's what we are going to oh, uh, focus on, because this is what the staging process is all about. So first, understanding that learning applies to the list of files uh, that we have. Staging applies to the attributes for each file type, or the attributes for each parameter. So to talk about the actual staging process, we're going to focus just on these two. Um, comment and last name. So right now we're in the learning process. So these are not in the policy yet. This is the suggestion list. But eventually they hit 90, 100%. And as a reminder, if it was in manual learning, we would have to add those. If it was automatic learning, they would get added for us automatically. And the moment they're added as ex allowed parameters, then begins the staging process. The staging process begins the moment they're on the allowed parameters list, or the moment a file type is on the file types list. And now begins this process of what I like to say is ASM is trying to evaluate a picture of this parameter. I want to know, it wants to know what this parameter should look like. And where is it going to get that picture? From requests that are coming in, what people are filling in in the fields, and it's going to look at every request, and it's going to start building a picture of it. Now, the moment those parameters are added to the list, the only thing you're going to see is the parameter value type, and it's going to be set to ignore value. 
That's the, that's the moment a parameter is added. And what that basically means is I don't care what people fill into that field. They can put whatever they want <laughs> at this point. Now let's say I walk away and come back a week later. And a week later I notice that, uh, oh, some of these settings have changed. Both of these fields, the parameter value type has changed to user input value. <coughs> My uh, comment field has a data type, alphanumeric, they both do. And my comment field has a max length of 50, last name max length of 10. Well, 50 characters is not really enough for the comment field. And 10 characters isn't really enough for the, max, for the uh, last name field. But we're still evaluating. It hasn't made its final decision yet. It's still evaluating. So a week later, I come back and look again. And now I notice some more things have changed. The comment field now has a max length of 500 characters. It also includes a bunch of allowed meta characters based on what people have been filling in to the comments. They've been putting in commas and question marks and hash symbols, colons, you name it. We also have the check on attack signatures, which looks a little bit like this. So the ability to block, for example, a SQL injection attack on one of my parameters it needs to be checking for attack signatures on that parameter. And so now that's been added. So now we know that for these two fields, they're now also going to be looking to see if requests trigger an attack signature. So this is going to be something, this is all part of the staging process. So remember earlier we looked and said all of these parameters are still in staging because they're all going through this process of getting a picture of every single parameter. And sometimes you'll see this little icon. What that means is ASM has learned something new. One or more things, it has learned something and is potentially going to make a change to the parameter attributes. Maximum length has gone up, a new meta character, whatever. By the way, this indicator here just says it's just waiting for more data keep sending more data. So how long is this staging process? Go back a slide here. So uh, actually, let me go to this slide here. There we go. So how long is this staging process? So I had you look at that value earlier when you're looking at the building of the process, the enforcement readiness period, seven days. That's the default value. People rarely change that value. So here's the kind idea, here's the concept, the easiest way to sort of put this picture in your head. ASM is looking at the comment field and it's finally said, okay, how about 200 maximum length and here's a bunch of meta characters. Okay, great. Day goes by, no, no new requests have come in that have altered that picture very much. Another day goes by, nothing new has come in that's altered it, but by the Fourth day, there have been just enough requests for comments of 400 characters long that ASM says, you know what? I think I need to change the picture of the comment field. I think I need to increase the uh, maximum length to 500 characters. So it's going to do that, and then it's going to basically reset the enforcement readiness period. And it's going to start again. Now it's 500 maximum characters with a bunch of meta characters, and a day goes by picture doesn't change, another day goes by, picture doesn't change. It could go all the way to the sixth day and I get a bunch of exclamation points that have never been added to the allowed meta characters. We do it again. But when seven days goes by and nothing about the parameter has changed, none of those attributes have changed, now it is ready to be enforced. That particular parameter is ready to be enforced. What does that mean? Talk about that in a moment. But it's ready to be enforced. But uh, for example, you said your example on the fifth day, there will be a certain amount of requests that change that, that up. But what about if I have one? It depends. Is it from a trusted source or an untrusted source? One request from a trusted, uh, I'm sorry, one request from an untrusted source, not enough. But 
even when what we're talking about here, even one request from an untrusted source is not enough. It needs to get a certain amount of, of requests. I'm not gonna tell you exactly how many, because I don't know. Like, the, um, but we don't want it to base on just one request anyway. Yeah, that's what I asked. Yeah. Um, you had a question earlier, and I forgot to come back to you, Romain. Okay, good, good. See, I knew I was going to. Yes. And then it needs a period of seven days. Seven days. Seven days, no change, in order to suggest enforcement. To suggest enforcement. Now remember, we could be doing this in either manual or automatic learning. So if we're doing this, hold one second. If we're doing this in manual learning, then what's going to happen is we're going to see some that have this icon now. This is ASN's way of telling you I think this parameter is ready to be enforced. Nothing about it has changed in a week. But I have to manually enforce it. Otherwise, it just sits like this forever. Is that a big deal? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. To enforce these, I just select the checkboxes, and then down at the bottom, there's an enforce button. You can enforce all of these now. You can enforce them before they're told that they're ready to be enforced if you wanted to. In automatic mode, as soon as something is ready to be enforced, it's enforced in automatic mode. We're talking about a couple of different things here. So let's assume we're in manual mode again. Let's go back to manual mode. And I'm getting some indicators that say, hey, ASM has learned some new stuff. In manual mode, ASM doesn't apply that new stuff to the parameter automatically. Where do you suppose you'll find those, chain, those ideas? Which one? Which page do you think I would go to? Traffic the traffic learning page. So in fact, if you click on this, this is a clickable item. If you click on this, it'll actually take you to the traffic learning page, and it'll show you the suggestions for this particular parameter. In manual mode, you have to accept those suggestions manually. To, add, to increase the maximum length, or whatever it is. In automatic mode, it applies those suggestions automatically. Um, I'm, I'm now trying to remember what your question was, because I was, uh, well, um, so go back to your question again. If, uh, for example, length of parameter is getting large, and it is still a valid traffic, legal traffic, how will it will act? It would make it larger, or? <coughs> okay, <duration>? so if, <coughs> If we've enforced, and by the way, this is what it'll look like once the parameters are enforced or once they're out of staging and they're, they're enforced. If the parameter is enforced and a request comes in and it's longer than the maximum length for that and we're in blocking mode, blocking. it's going to get blocked. But it's going to apply that towards a potential suggestion that if it gets more requests like that, it will increase it. But it won't get to this point for so long that by the time it's gotten to that point, that maximum length has probably got to be correct. And the next person who submits something higher than that, that's really long, that's really too big. So you know, keep in mind, this does not happen overnight. That doesn't mean you can't do it manually. You could come in and enforce all of these. And you could change the attributes yourself manually. In fact, I think I have a screen coming up. I don't know if I have a screen coming up. But if I don't, uh, you guys will see it in your exercise. But you can adjust all of these attribute values yourself. You can put in the maximum length you want. You can put in the meta characters that are allowed. So this is the final summary slide of all this that we're talking about. Learning versus staging. Can I ask you one first? Uh, I'm not sure if it, because it's uh, related to what Todd asked, asked it first. Uh, this automatic learning process, uh, do we have any information on how much load it put into the box instead of it, it wasn't doing this job? Yeah, 13.2 <laughs> gigawatts. <laughs> no, I don't have an answer to that. 
<laughs> Is that what it was? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't have an answer for that. I, how would you quantify that? I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm not sure how much. Is it going to slow down your application performance? No. Okay, that's good. That's all that matters, right? So the answer is no. <laughs> right. No. No, this is all part of ASM. I mean, it's part of the product. Does GTM, does, does, does the public DNS, does that slow down my access to web pages if I had just used the IP address instead? If I just use the IP address to get to the website, does DNS just slow down that process? Sure it does, because we have to go back and forth trying to resolve that host name. So does that mean we should get rid of DNS because it's slowing down a little bit? No, it, yeah. it, pro <laughs> it provides a service that is valuable. So yeah, everything we add is always going to have some impact. It just is. But you're asking me if it's a noticeable impact. And I can't really answer that question because I haven't done this in a production environment. I have, I have talked to many SEs about ASM who have been using it out there. I talk about the specialization events. I have never had a one tell me, yeah, I have a lot of customers that stopped using it because it was too slow for them. Yeah. All right, so summary slide. You understand this, you'll be in pretty good shape. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a variety of illegal requests, illegal based on the policy we have in place at this time. We're going to start with our whitelists of file type and parameter. So I've already built these whitelists. And I have a couple of illegal requests that come in. The first request is for a php.ini file. It's not on my whitelist. The next one is for a parameter that's not on my list of valid parameters. So they're both illegal. Up there it says, if I'm in transparent mode, will these two requests be allowed or blocked? Allowed. They'll be allowed, of course. Nothing gets blocked in transparent mode. If I'm in blocking mode, will they be allowed or blocked? blocked. What was that? Blocked. blocked. They'll be blocked. Yes. No. No. This is this is nothing to do with staging at this time. Okay. This is just my file type list, and it's a illegal file type or an illegal parameter violation. Because staging is the size of the parameters. Staging is about the parameters. It's the entities. This is just the entities themselves, the entity list. All right. This is what you did in your last exercise. Okay. You switched to blocking mode. You suddenly got blocked. Now we're also going to look at the actual parameters themselves. Uh, I'm going to focus on the comment parameter. And you'll notice that right now, all my parameters are still in staging. So the column up above says, now I'm looking at attributes of the file types and the parameters. And those attributes are in staging. The parameters are all in staging, OK? And I, my comment field looks like this. User input value, alphanumeric, maximum length of 300 characters, bunch of allowed meta characters, and it's checking for attack signatures. So a couple of illegal requests come in. The first request is for a comment that actually looks fine. Why is it illegal? That's not an allowed meta character yet at this time. So it's illegal. The second comment comes in, looks like this. You guys did this earlier. It's a cross-site script attack. So that's going to trigger a signature violation. So they're both illegal. So my question first is, if we're in transparent mode, Will these requests be allowed or blocked? Allowed. Nothing gets blocked in transparent mode. It's correct. If we're in blocking mode, do you suppose these will be allowed or blocked? Allowed. It does not depend. Be allowed. They will be allowed. They will be allowed because whenever something is not enforced, it will not block it because of violations of these things. File types, remember the length limit? So if I've got a PHP file type with a thousand character query string limit, and somebody submits a 20,000 query string .php request, if PHP is not enforced, 
that request is going through. But this is uh, um, very a script. Should it be something, should it be a kind of signature for a field? Because the guy, in theory, the user shouldn't be doing scripts. Right? Or well, this is just like what you did earlier, where you put the script inside of your field and you submitted it. Yeah. This is what it would look like when it got to the server. No, that, that's what I'm saying. This is not a kind of something that the server's door, the ASM should be looking, okay, this is a clearly a script. Should it be part of the parameters? It shouldn't be a kind of signature. No. Well, it is. If you go, if you look at the parameter uh, page, and you'll see it shows all, not all uh, scripts apply to parameters. Only a subset of scripts apply to parameters. Oh, so. so every parameter has a list of signatures that can be customized. You can actually disable a uh, signature just from one parameter if you wanted to. So if it's in stage and uh, the request falls into an attack signature, that won't be enforced? That's correct. That is correct. As, I just, as we just said, if I'm in blocking mode, great, I feel good. We're in blocking mode. And I find that people are still successfully getting SQL injection attacks or cross-site scripting attacks through, I better come and take a look at those parameters that are being affected because if they're still in staging, that's why it's happening. It's not enforcing the parameter. It's not enforcing any of this for the parameter, which includes attack signatures. All I have to do is take it out of staging. Either I manually take it out of staging or it has been taken out of staging through the automatic building, the automatic process. So now all of my parameters are enforced. We still have these two illegal requests that are submitted. If we're in transparent mode, will these requests be allowed or blocked? Yes. Nothing gets blocked in transparent mode. I hope that has become very clear to you at this time. If we're in blocking mode, do you suppose these will be allowed or blocked? They will now be blocked. So what it requires is to be in blocking mode and for something to be enforced in order for us to see the result we want, a blocked request for a bad, uh, for a bad malicious request, or a blocked response, I should say. It cannot be in staging. This is, to me, the summary, the meat of this very complicated s subject. And I have heard many a story of customers that don't understand why they're still being attacked. And what they find is all of their, they're in manual learning, and all of their parameters, all their file types are still in staging. Nothing's been enforced. That's why you guys need to learn this and go out there and help them. But also educate them ahead of time. So that yeah, better. right. Definitely. We don't want to have one of our customers with our product and we've helped them build the security policy and then they get hacked because we didn't help them properly or educate them properly on this kind of stuff. seen a lot of uh, new characters in the allowed characters and decides to move to a staging again to say, okay, I'm looking this and let me see. Every, everything is in a staging mode. Uh, I mean, maybe one day scripts are not allowed and you do something like this I mentioned, the scripts next day is allowed during, during seven days. It's possible, but again, let's go back to what I said earlier. By the time it becomes enforced in a real production environment, or by the time it's suggesting to enforce it, it's probably pretty well baked. The field is probably pretty well defined at that point in time. And again, we can look at it and say, you know, it didn't include the exclamation point. Maybe I'll add that also. I'll manually add it. Also, one other thing is, um, 
we can look at the log file. We can, we, can, we can go and monitor the log file regularly. And if somebody got blocked because they put in the exclamation point, I can see that immediately. I can use the log file to get the learning suggestion available to me that I can accept that learning suggestion in just a second, apply my policy, and now I've added that new element to my security policy, just from looking at the log file. And so that way I don't have to go through the staging process again. I can also lower the staging process from seven days. I can lower it to four, to three, to one, to zero, if I wanted to. So I essentially turn off that staging process. All right, so I'm going the wrong direction. So it is possible that your list of entities, some might be enforced and some might not. And as we were saying, this might pop back into staging at one point. Very possible. Earlier, we also saw that attack signatures start off in staging. Remember when we were building the policy and we saw the automatic settings, one of the settings was signature staging, enabled, disabled. So if I leave that to enabled, that means all of my signatures will be in staging until I enforce them. If I had chosen signature staging disabled, then all of my signatures would be enabled, uh, I'm sorry, enforced by default. Now, uh, I did want to point one thing out. We were just talking a couple minutes ago about some signatures only apply to parameters. You can actually see which ones. Okay. Some only apply to headers. So what we were talking about a couple days ago is all of these signatures that are in staging. I can, do, I can do a couple of things. I can take them all out of staging in just a second. Down at the bottom, there's a button that you can do. Just enable them all or enforce them all. I can enforce them individually if I wanted to manually. I can also go to a page, our learning and blocking settings page, and we can disable signature staging altogether. Or I can monitor what's happening and I can see which signatures are hitting us. And then I can pick and choose which ones I want to enforce. And that's what that, that, uh, the, uh, the, what's called the enforcement readiness section of the learning page. And it'll tell you how many signatures have been triggered but are not yet enforced. And when you click on the little link for that, it brings you to this page, but it only has the, the uh, signatures that have been triggered. And then you can just enforce them if you want. So you can do an enforcement process as you go. So let's say, um, so now here I've got a, some, some signatures that are enforced and some are not. Why is this important? It's important for the exact same reason about parameter staging and file type staging. If I have a header signature that is still in staging, it's not enforced, even if I'm in blocking mode, that signature is going to be allowed through. It's going to be allowed to go in. So just like all of our other items, anytime something's in staging, go back to this table. Anytime something's in staging, it's never going to get blocked, even if I'm in blocking mode. Keep that table in your head. Is there a way to, I was wondering, uh, I didn't, I'm still in learning mode, so I didn't disable a parameter left the stage, so it was, up, was enforced, mm -hmm. but it might come back, as you said. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for me to tell, to, so to force that the, all the parameters that stop staging they don't go back to stage. That was the exact same question Roman had earlier, and I said no. So this is one place that you can literally turn off all signature staging for this policy. One click, one save, one apply. I also heard a story about an SE told me who was took, took over an account in Japan, and they'd had their ASM security policy in for at least a year still getting a hit with all these attacks. And all they had to do is come in, clear that checkbox, save it and apply it, and they were done. They were now safe. It took them a year to do that because they didn't know about it. And they also did not understand what this staging thing meant. Because if you don't understand that, that's quite complicated. 
So we've now covered three things, three categories. We covered the automatic versus manual learning, using either trusted or untrusted requests, and then what learning applies to, those white lists over there, file types, URLs, parameters, and then staging, which is the process of putting together a picture for each one of those entities. And then most importantly, why that staging and enforcement is so important. So we have to have things enforced. This is probably the more, <laughs> the meaty, more meaty ASM exercise that you're going to do. You're going to first, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have a file type. You've already built your file type list. So you're going to have a file type that has a query string length, a thousand characters. And you're going to violate that query string length and see what happens. And then look at what enforcement does. Then you're going to completely lose that security policy and you're going to start from scratch with your security policy and create a new one using automatic learning and trusted IP addresses and see how different this process is. You're going to use the macro. What I want you to see through this process, so we're going to be simulating a lot of requests using the macro. You're going to lower, drastically lower, your learning speeds. You have to in order to see the results of this, de uh, this exercise. But what I want you to see is I want you to see a parameter come out of staging. I want you to see a parameter have values set for it automatically and have it come out of staging automatically. And that's the goal of the exercise. And then once it's enforced, we'll see if it blocks some bad things. Alrighty? So this should take you probably about 45 minutes at least. So that'll take us to, what is it, 2, 2 15? So around 3 o'clock, um, I have a meeting at 3, so right before 3 o'clock is when maybe about 10 to 3, I'll give you some weekend suggestions. And then uh, after my meeting, I'll probably come join you guys maybe for the Beer Friday. Sound good? How do we feel about ASM? Are you excited about it? It's a fun product to work with, isn't it? ASM is short for awesome. There you go. I like that. Explain it thoroughly. Well, now it's your job <laughs> to go out and explain it thoroughly. Um, all right, well, have fun with the exercise, and let me know if you need any help at all.